Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Friday and the final edition of Smart Buildings Week. Uh, we certainly appreciate those of you who are attending today and for many of you who have turned into multiple, multiple sessions uh, this week, we really uh, appreciate your participation. Uh, my name is Stan Price uh, and I'm joined today by a couple of colleagues, uh, Carrie Mead, who's the Executive Director of the Smart Building Center. Uh, and in the background is the magician, uh, Britton Reif, who you don't see here, but uh, who is helping us make sure that everything runs uh, smoothly today. Uh, before I introduce our uh, single speaker today, I do want to make sure that I once again thank our event sponsors. Uh, without them, uh, this Smart Buildings Week would not have been possible. Um, so that would certainly include Microsoft, who is our title sponsor, uh, as well as McKinstry, Seattle City Light, Puget Sound Energy, DB Engineering, Long Building Technologies, uh, McDonald Miller, uh, ATS Automation, the Seattle King County Chapter of BOMA, uh, as well as the Washington State Department of Commerce uh, and Belimo. As many of you know, uh, this virtual Smart Buildings Week was a replacement for our anticipated two-day in-person conference. Um, as you might guess, we've had to delay that plan, uh, now rescheduled, uh, knock on wood, hopefully, for August the 24th and 25th of uh, 2021. Uh, so stay posted. We very much hope to continue and expand this conversation uh, about smart buildings uh, next year. Just a couple of housekeeping issues uh, for attendees. Your camera and audio have been disabled, but we still want to hear from you. Uh, so if you go down to the Zoom function for the question and answer, uh, not the chat function, we've disabled that, but the uh, Q&A function, uh, please feel free to post your questions there. We'll be monitoring them throughout today's presentation uh, and hope to be able to address as many of those uh, as we can. Uh, over uh, perhaps in a, uh, in a week or so, we hope to have all the content from this week posted for you, uh, both in terms of the recorded um, uh, uh, webinars themselves, as well as the presentation material. Each of you will get a, uh, an alert, an email with a link to where you can go and download that information. So uh, rest assured that the material will be available to you and we'll let you know kind of when and where uh, that it's available. Okay, let's uh, let's get to it. It's really my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Spiros Sakaliardias, uh, who's been with Microsoft since uh, 2003. Uh, he works um, uh, in their smart buildings and places area, encompassing everything from uh, facility operations to occupancy to security to all things sustainability. Uh, but in reality, Spiros is actually a Renaissance guy. Uh, he holds degrees from the University of Oxford and the University of Pittsburgh in uh, both physics and philosophy, which uh, makes him um, in some pretty heady uh, stuff. Uh, he's had a really varied career, uh, worked in a number of different areas uh, over, uh, over his career, but uh, I can't not mention the fact that he's currently uh, a member of the board of directors uh, of the Smart Building Center. And so we not only appreciate his contributions today, but appreciate his ongoing contributions to the work of the Smart Building Center. So Spiros, welcome. Um, we're really looking forward to your remarks. Uh, thank you. I, uh, firstly, uh, let's try this. Can you hear me? We, I can. Excellent. So I'm assuming everyone else can hear me. Uh, so with that, I assume um, my task now is to share my screen. Uh, just let me know if you can see it and then I will uh, move along. So are you, able, you are able to see it? All right. And yes. um, with luck, then the attendees uh, can see it and can hear me. We'll know right away from them if they can't. Excellent. And you will let me know. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Spiros. I'm, as Stan mentioned, uh, at Microsoft working on smart buildings. Uh, I can't nearly live up to all the things he said I can do or uh, am capable of. 
uh, but I will try and uh, gloss over that. Um, one of the things I am responsible for at Microsoft is working with our product teams on how our products can best help customers uh, around uh, smart buildings and smart cities, uh, as well as uh, topics like sustainability and working with partners and, and customers uh, alike. Uh, to that degree, we are our own customer. And so uh, a lot of what uh, I do is involved in working with our own internal real estate team on how we operate our own facilities. We've got a lot of buildings in, in, uh, in Redmond. We have a lot of buildings around the world. And so part of what I'll talk to you today about is what we do uh, and also what we have done with customers. So with that said, let me uh, dive into this. Uh, I guess the first thing that should be obvious is that um, I'm from Greece. And therefore, uh, the building that I want to talk about is this. All right, so, you know, the, the big question is, you know, why do we want to uh, uh, have this conversation, right? What is it we're talking about with smart buildings? And what is it we want to do with buildings? Well, we have sort of two main goals, I guess. One is that they meet the objectives of the owners of the building. Uh, and one is that they meet the objectives of the occupants of the building. So is it is it uh, safe to be in? Uh, is it uh, uh, is it low cost to maintain and operate and so on? Uh, you know, one question is how long will the building last? Well, this one lasted about three thousand years. Uh, I don't know what uh, the house that I'm currently sitting in is going to look like in three thousand years, but I venture to say it won't be standing. So what's different today than back in the days of, of the, the ancient Greeks, right, is that we have tons of data. It's all about data. Uh, and the internet of things is transforming the world in terms of allowing us to understand how buildings are performing, understanding uh, how they are responding to things we're doing in terms of maintaining them and so on. Basically, the IoT is transforming uh, the built environment. So with that, uh, what we're getting out of it is improved uh, utilization, healthier buildings, more efficient buildings, uh, improved productivity, and so on. And what I'll do is I'll take you through, uh, firstly, where we're seeing this uh, have impact, and secondly, uh, some lessons learned as uh, as we've been doing this and what sort of things our technologies are able to do uh, in this sphere. That said, let's then move on. Um, you know, the thing that we're going to have going backwards and forwards uh, in, in all these slides is that we really are serving two masters. One, the people that own the building, two, the people that are in the building. And while these, generally speaking, are consistent and or have consistent goals, uh, it's not always the case. And these, these, uh, uh, these occupants may want the temperature of the building to be 72 degrees when outside it's 100. Uh, so they want air conditioning. And of course, the building owner, uh, it costs them a lot of money to provide air conditioning. So, you know, that's contrary to the building owner's desires. So those, you know, there's a there's a juggling to be had there. Uh, but as my friends at McDonald Miller keep reminding me, um, a happy tenant is one who renews his lease. So, you know, the owner of the building will eventually knuckle down and pay the cost of the air conditioning because he wants those tenants to renew their lease. So uh, let's try and understand what it is that we can do uh, and where it is we're having impact. Well, Customers come to us and, you know, again, we're our own customers, so our own real estate uh, and, and uh, uh, HR department come to us wanting lots of different things. And, you know, you've got to prioritize what it is you can do and where your technologies uh, should be applied, where your limited resources should be applied. And what, we've, what we've determined over time uh, or what we've noticed over time is that we have significant impact uh, in various areas, 
there are dozens of areas where, uh, you know, the, sort of the long tail of it all, but at the, um, at the core of it all are really these sort of six scenarios around facilities management, around space, uh, travel, transportation, safety, and workplace experience. And then, of course, uh, something which was always, you know, ninth or tenth place has suddenly become first place, which is health and wellness, right? Uh, the last six months have, have shown an incredible uh, importance of how uh, we need to make sure that the people in a building are able to, to stay healthy. So let's take a look at some of these. Um, first and foremost, let's take a look at facilities management. And uh, one of the, you know, one of the main topics of the Smart Building Center, of course, is all around how do you deal with managing buildings. Now, uh, we have a lot of uh, experience here. Uh, again, we don't produce any end-to-end -end applications. We produce a, a platform, our, our Windows Azure platform, our Dynamics, our office and so on. Uh, but we do a lot of work with companies that are implementing uh, FM applications. And one of the things that, uh, that we see right off the bat is that this has a huge impact, right? Uh, the, the biggest impact that, that immediately hits you between the eyes is how it reduces your costs. Uh, and in particular, if you, um, if you implement a, a smart building system around facilities management, uh, one of the things that, that happens is that you start fixing problems before uh, they become big problems. You start managing your equipment so it's, it's running more efficiently, the net result of which is you're saving electricity. Uh, if, you're, um, if you're a building owner, uh, you phrase this as you're saving money. If you're a building operator, you save this. At, you phrase this as you're saving electricity. If you're a sustainability wonk, you say you phrase this as you're saving carbon. Uh, all comes down to the same thing, but the results are quite dramatic. Let me just show you what we're achieving on our own campus. This is the energy electricity used by one building, it happens to be uh, Advanta A, starting in November 2010, going to the end of last year. And the only thing we did in February of 2013 was add software, right? Um, there are a lot of other things we do, uh, but statistically, the only thing that has a correlation to why that, that uh, uh, linear regression. Uh, once, once a building has been on the remote monitoring for five years, uh, we're seeing a, uh, you know, about a 30% reduction in, in uh, electrical costs. Another area that we're seeing a lot of uh, value is around space utilization. Uh, again, a lot of the IoT work where we're getting data about who's in a space, where, where, they're, where they are, how many people are in the space, and so on. Uh, the impact of that from the owner's perspective is uh, you know, a better understanding of how much space is needed, whether we need more large spaces, short spaces, I mean, small spaces, uh, and so on. Uh, we're, we're able to save a, a lot of money through uh, working on analytics around who should be and so on. Of course, in, in COVID times, the big thing that everyone's interested in is, you know, where is someone in a building? tracking a, a person through a space so that the cleaning crew can go in and disinfect anything that a person has touched, uh, understanding whether the number of people in a space is exceeding uh, the, the, the capacity, whether the people in the spaces are um, safe distancing and so on. But that's sort of all IoT type work and, and, and analytics we can do around there. Uh, health and wellness, of course, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the topic du jour. Uh, and we have partners such as Infosys that are deploying in you know, a whole series of different types of applications on top of our platform uh, for, uh, you know, the wellness of, uh, uh, of the building, for uh, things to make sure that cleaners are tracked properly to detect whether people are wearing face masks, to make sure that no more than you know, three people are in an elevator at a time to understand whether there is social distancing compliance and so on. That's all, again, using the same data, uh, just applying a different type of application above it. 
Uh, part of the, uh, the overall scenario, this is an old picture, of course, there's no face, face masks on these guys, but trying to understand um, where, where uh, you know, vehicles are, where they're going on our campus. Uh, we, have, we have buses taking people around uh, the campus all the time, or at least we did pre-COVID, uh, moving about 7,000 people around a day, uh, checking uh, 522,000 people through our turnstiles. Uh, again, using IoT data to optimize that, reduce the amount of time it takes to get from building A to building B, or reducing the amount of time it takes to get <coughs> badged in and so on. You know, a big topic other than health and wellness is job site safety. Uh, this, uh, this is a picture, of course, from building the Seattle Space Needle. Notice these guys are not wearing harnesses. They are just sort of dangling above the, the ground. It's kind of scary. Um, but it's a big issue and a lot of uh, construction companies are doing this. Also in, in commercial areas, you know, here's something trying to see whether someone's about, about to fall off uh, the bell tower in Seville. But more, more um, you know, con construction related, enterprise related construction companies using it to track whether workers are wearing the right uh, protective equipment, whether they're about to fall off a ledge and so on. Uh, and finally, the one that, that uh, is, is very frequently uh, sort of demanded is something to do with uh, improving the experience of the people in a building. Um, you know, these two are obviously socially distanced, but they're not wearing masks. And so then this is also a pre-COVID shot, of course. But there's a lot of, uh, a lot of interest and a lot of applications on how can you make sure that the room is at the right temperature uh, for your preferences that if you are, uh, if this is a hotspot uh, desking environment, you know, where can I find a desk that, that meets my needs? Does it go up and down? Is it near a window? Is it not near a window? Um, is, it a, is it in a location near someone I want to talk to or far away from someone that, that I find uh, is very disruptive, right? So all of these things all fit into uh, the same uh, category of things that, that uh, were, we're seeing impact from our uh, technologies. Uh, there's there are some learnings. The, one of the initial learnings is that, um, well, firstly, you've got to narrow down what it is you're going to work on. Secondly, that there is a hierarchy of things to do. Uh, if, if a company starts uh, thinking about what they're going to do, for example, for the workers, uh, for the occupants, and they deploy an application. Well, that application wants its own sensors and wants some sort of infrastructure to collect it. Then they go and deploy a second application. It has its own infrastructure, its own sensors. By the time you've got to your 10th application, you have Spaghetti Junction. Um, and it is either simply redundant and expensive or incompatible and a problem. Uh, what we find is that the most successful deployments are ones where you start literally at the bottom around facilities management, putting it in an infrastructure that collects data from every sensor you have. And then from there uh, is able to allow you to, to layer on top other applications without creating a whole new data collection infrastructure, without creating a whole new set of sensors. Let's go through some of these um, one at a time. Uh, let's start with, you know, what's the deck that you're dealt with, right? You've got an existing building. You know, we hear a lot about people are building a new building. They want to put this in or put that in. And that's very exciting. But, you know, the, the, the biggest problem is what do we do with existing buildings? And these buildings might be five years old. They may be 50 years old. They may be in a dry climate. They may be in a humid climate. They may be facing the sun in great construction. They may be, you know, in the Arctic with terrible construction or vice versa, right? So we've got to deal with uh, what, what are we going to do? How can we, how can we retrofit things uh, and so on? There appears to be a question in the Q&A. Um, jobs associated with making smart buildings. Yeah. So absolutely, we'll get to that uh, um, a little bit later. Um, if I don't get to this when I start talking about field service, uh, if you could, if you could interrupt me, Stan. I'll remind you. Excellent. Um, 
so uh, you know that what do, what do, what do we need to do? Um, first, let's state, take stock of what we have, and and just looking, for example, at the the environment that I'm in here in Puget Sound, we've got 125 buildings uh, of all different shapes, sizes, colors, construction quality, height, orientation, and so on. The only thing that doesn't change between the ones in Puget Sound is the climate, which right now sucks with a lot of <laughs> you know, really bad air. Um, but it's not the buildings that we're actually controlling, right? What we, what we need to control are the, the, the pieces of equipment. And in those 125 buildings, we've got lots of different things. Now, again, you're not actually controlling this. You're controlling, there's your Belima. I heard Belima was one of the sponsors of this con, uh, you know, conference. Here's a Belima actuator. You're getting data from all these sorts of things and you're controlling these sorts of things or setting set points here, right? getting live video data here. Um, so this is the thing that's of primary interest. And on our campus here, we have 456,000 data points on these guys. Uh, but we're, we're not actually talking to those, of course. We're talking to these layers of things, the Johnsons, the Siemens, the, the Schneiders, the, the Allertons, the Honeywells, and so on. Uh, and all the data from these 456 are being funneled through these. Uh, but again, we're not actually talking to those. We're talking to these. Um, which is the first thing that's got an IP address. Uh, and we're down to here. So we've got this hierarchy. Um, we go from small number of buildings, large number of pieces of equipment, lots and lots of things that we need to understand that's funneled through some sort of hierarchy down to a few devices that we're actually going to uh, monitor. We're gonna try and get the information about from this thing through that to control that so that the people wandering around here are happy or inside the buildings are happy. Now, one of the other things we're landed with is um, you know, the, the, the tyranny of lots of non-talking systems. You've got your FM systems, you've got your power meter systems, you've got your security systems, you've got your occupancy systems, you've got your lighting systems. And generally speaking, none of these characters talk to each other. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's costly it's counterproductive and so on, but it's what we got. And last but not least, we've got a lot of really bad engineering. At least not on our campus, of course, but in other ones. Um, you know, courtesy of DB engineering, a bunch of shots, you know, why would you have four thermostats on the same wall, right? Or what is software gonna be do, able to do when there are no VFDs on 900 pieces of equipment? Right? Software is not going to be able to help you if you cannot control the speed of the fan. So, you know, you need to understand, you need to assess the building, and that goes partly to an answer to one of the questions earlier. Uh, none of these things can start until you have a good um, team of uh, controls engineers, building engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, even some IT people, assess the quality of the building and the equipment and the communications, right? There's, there's a bunch of uh, hardcore engineers that have got to crawl through your environment before we can sort of assess whether software can actually do anything for you. All right, so assuming software can do something for you, we split it up into, into four main areas where uh, uh, we see a, um, uh, a value or where we can where we can make some impact. Uh, taking these in turn, let's start with data acquisition, right? Um, the strategy that that we deploy or that we, that we recommend that we do ourselves uh, around the data acquisition portion is to normalize and consolidate all your data acquisition. You want to have one data acquisition strategy for everything. You don't want to have your data acquisition strategy, for the sound sensors, another one for the FM sensors, another one for the lighting sensors, another one for the uh, occupancy sensors. You want to have one network, um, possibly two, because you may want to separate out your corpnet network, but you want to basically have one sensor network. Uh, and you want to have a clear path how everything goes through that. From the building owner's perspective, it's reducing your costs. It's increasing your security. It shortens the time it takes to, to, to deploy new applications for your, for your constituents. 
Now, um, let's look at where we're starting. We're typically starting with something I call network anarchy, right? I got a little triangle with, a, with a, an electrical jolt thing here, right? This is where you've got all these different systems, all of which are talking in a different way. I'm assuming that you put them all in the cloud because otherwise uh, uh, we have other problems. But you have all these different applications. They're all talking to different sets of sensors and through their own network. So step one is get them all talking through one way out. Step two is get rid of all these things and have essentially, no matter what sensor it is, it's going through a single or you know a few different gateways to one point in the cloud. Right? What, what this strategy does, A, it simplifies things. It secondly, uh, in terms of security, one outbound IP port that you need to protect as opposed to, um, you know, whatever it is, 10 IP ports or 50 IP ports or 1,000 IP ports, right? This is where we want to get to. This is where we, along, we, we, we move our customers to, where we move ourselves to. Uh, we have essentially uh, the concept of a gateway. Uh, you may have one gateway for your entire campus. You may have one gateway per building. Uh, that's a that's a design question, but ultimately, you know, this could be, for example, a backnet gateway from Iconics or from Kepler or from Matricon, right? Or an LPC gateway, a Modbus gateway, or a gateway that can do multiple protocols. So, for example, um, in uh, you know, building 121, uh, I've got both a Modbus and backnet running on this thing, pulling in all the different sensors from about five and a half thousand different data points in that building. So the, 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 the first step towards achieving some of those goals and making an impact is not really at the level of Microsoft technologies, but your networking and your hardware people. From a, from a Microsoft perspective, it's all, we got to get that data to Azure IoT Hub, to a single location in the cloud. So all these applications can say, you know, you put in a new application, where am I getting my data from? I'm getting it here. Another application goes in, where am I getting my data from? I'm getting from here. They don't have to think about the individual sensor. Now, other than network consolidation, we've got data anarchy, right? Before we had network anarchy. Did I call it network anarchy? Uh, yes, network anarchy. I'm calling this one data anarchy, right? Where this set of sensors gives off data in some format. Another set of sensors gives off data in another format. Another set of sensors gives off data in another format. Uh, we could send all this up to Azure IoT Hub like that. Um, again, how we deal with it at the application layer level is going to be painful when every type of sensor is setting up its own uh, structure. So what we do is we like to, we want to make sure we normalize it. So whether you put some function here, some function here, some function just there, but ultimately what you want is every application that you're going to deploy to see data in one structure, right? So that it doesn't matter whether it's a temperature sensor, a humidity sensor, um, some sort of uh, occupancy sensor that works with RFID. Ultimately, you can tell an application, you're gonna get data from your device, it's going to have a device ID, a value and a timestamp, right? Normalization is one of the things that really drives cost reduction, simplification, and so on. And one of the things that I really like about it is that's how I want to deploy or test a new application. Uh, some company comes to you, um, you know, Honeywell, Siemens, Schneider, one of, one of these people says, I've got a new fantastic app for uh, tracking people through a building. So you say, okay, well, let's, let's work on it. What are we going to do? Well, the first thing we do is we deploy it in the cloud and we say, here's the data. We don't have to go off and try and say, well, where do I find an occupancy sensor? Where do I find a temperature sensor? So it's all right here, right? Sorry about the dog. Um, again, this is all part of that first stage, what I was calling uh, data acquisition. Um, then the main strategy is consolidate and normalize. And at that point, uh, the normalization is, is, uh, is what we can do with our technologies. So uh, a quick demo. 
um, just for the sake of it. I don't know whether you'll see it, uh, but this is something called Azure Device Explorer. I'm pointing to uh, my building 121. And all I want to show you here is that uh, every five minutes I'm polling for data. So let's say that it's, it's hopefully polling. What we'll see in, in, uh, within a few minutes is that data starts flying through, as you see. So this is giving me five and a half thousand records every five minutes. And what you can see from this is at this stage, cancel, I can't really cancel this thing. I've got to wait for five and a half thousand records to go by. But ultimately, I'm getting a device ID and a value and a timestamp. Uh, it's, it doesn't care about what's giving me the data, but all the data for that building is coming through a single location, which happens to be the Azure IoT hub for that building. Let me go so, so much for my demo. Uh, I've got to move really quick because you know my uh, my outage took up half my time <laughs> there. Um, analytics, right? Second layer of this strategy here is every application that we buy, deploy, recommend to our customers should be able to use Azure IoT Hub as the source of the data. If the application says, no, I got to go install my own sensors and I can, I talk to it with a proprietary protocol, you take goodbye. There are plenty of other fish in the sea here, right? We're only looking at applications that are good cloud citizens that can talk to uh, our, our service bus, our Azure IoT Hub. What this does is it increases the number of solutions you can run. I can have you know, 10, I can have a thousand applications that are all talking to that same Azure IoT Hub. If you try to put a thousand applications to talk directly to your BMS, uh, you're, you're dead in the water, right? We have one application that talks to the BMS. That's the, in our case, the Iconics IoT Works Gateway, but it can be whatever gateway you choose. But there's one thing that talks to the gateway, pushes it up to Azure IoT Hub, and then let democracy rule, right? Anyone who wants to get that data can just get to it from Azure IoT Hub. And we require that there is interoperability between them. Specifically, again, you know, starting with the problem, my little, my little icon that I created, um, I'm calling this application isolationism, right? Um, it's back to the thing I showed you earlier. Even though they're all getting the data from IoT Hub, they all are getting different types of data and they're not talking to each other. How would you, for example, say, I am going to heat the building only when there are people in it? Well, if the, if the um, HVAC data is here and the occupancy data is here and these two things can't talk to each other, I can't achieve that savings. Uh, so I just put the building on a regular schedule, someone walks in and then is freezing cold. And um, you know, that doesn't do well for my, uh, for my uh, occupant experience. And I can't, you know, the, I don't want the user to have to go to a thermostat on the wall and keep pressing the button and realize that the thermostat's being disconnected or it doesn't work because you're not on the edge back schedule, right? So what we want are systems that communicate to each other. And in technical terms, what that means is any application that we're willing to put on the network or talk to a customer putting in has got to have an open API or query mechanism. You've got to be able to get the data in and out of that application, or it's not an application that we're willing to work with, right? If you want an occupancy uh, application on your network, it has got to have a way that it can read data from IoT Hub and be able to tell other applications what it found. So that's the... Um, uh, at the application level there, we have, you know, this is my mandatory slide on, on Microsoft technologies. Uh, we have lots of different things in our, in our Azure IoT environment. Uh, if an application talks to uh, Event Hub or one of our other uh, Azure uh, services, we can then tunnel to lots of other things and apply any of the, the Microsoft technologies there. So an application that is built well on our platform has built in a certain amount of interoperability as well. So if, for example, the occupancy solution uh, talks to IoT Hub and the FM solution talks to IoT Hub, they can communicate through IoT Hub. Anyway, 
Um, one of the things I want to point out again to that question that was at the beginning, uh, you need OT people, right? Uh, a, an application today is not going to solve your building problems without good OT people, right? This is the same application on the same building over the same period of time, but one set of uh, OT people created these rules, another set of OT people created these rules. The people looking at the screens from this application are looking at on average 150 faults over the last seven days. The ones looking at these screens are seeing on average about 500 faults. Same software, same building, same IoT. Now, this one maybe gives you a lot more granular information, but maybe it's too much information to process. Maybe it overloads your people. Maybe they can't prioritize. Maybe there are a lot of false positives. This one, easier to prioritize, easier to work on, but maybe there's some data that's missing. There's no absolute correct answer. Should you have you know, very strict rules? Should you have more lenient rules? Should you look for granularity? Should you look for a higher level? Should you only uh, push through high priority alerts? These are OT type questions, not uh, not IT questions. The IT should be able to deliver either of these depending on how the guys want to do it, right? Now, the one thing I like to put in here is today because Stan keeps asking me what are things can be able to do tomorrow? How are you going to get people out of the, the network? How are you going to be able to rely on less people? And this is where machine learning and things like that are trying to change the environment. Hold on a second. There was a, there were several questions in the thing here. OT. Spiros, Spiros, yeah. Can technology. you tell us what what uh, what you mean by OT? What does that stand for? So OT uh, means people like Trevor who are on uh, uh, the call earlier, or the people from CBRE that we subcontract to, um, the mechanical engineers, the building operators, and so on, as opposed to IT, which are you know. Uh, dweebs like me that are writing in you know, computer <laughs> systems. Right? Got it. Got it. Thanks. All right. So back to my screen here. There, you know, everyone and their brother is trying to work out how machine learning can take the place of not having enough uh, skilled mechanical building engineers around, or uh, how machine learning can tell from seeing the data patterns that something is wrong without having to hard code a fault rule in there. Uh, there is limited success in that. Um, mind you, if you read everyone's marketing literature, there's grand success in it, but don't believe everything you read. Uh, <laughs> there, is, there is limited success in that, but everyone is working on that. And in the future, that will be the case. Apparently my dog has got a, some, some uh, comments on that one too. Um, we're going to count him as an attendee, though, Spiros. Yes, so. exactly. So, yes, we're all trying to work on that and change it. But as of today, the fault rules are only as good as the engineers that created them. All right, uh, demo. What was I going to do for a demo here? Uh, I was going to briefly just show you, oh, I don't know. Here, here is uh, uh, Iconics on one of our buildings where we're able to see uh, what, uh, look at an individual floor see the temperature in, see what the faults are on that floor and so on, and get people to work on it. I don't really have time given it's my, uh, uh, my network outage and so on, so enough of the demo, but we can always do more on that. Um, the presentation here, the strategy here is um, best of breed graphics, right? One of the things that uh, we frequently see is people arguing about what application they should use because they like the graphics better. Right? That's the wrong way around. If you choose your applications well, and they're all interoperable, you should be able to use any graphics engine you want on top of it. Now, we have a lot of different uh, graphics engines ourselves. We have Azure Maps. Uh, we can do things uh, with uh, you know, just hard coding a web app and so on. We have time series insights, we have Power BI, 
but there are a lot of third parties. So Iconics has its own graphics engine. Willow has got a really cool one. Uh, the point is that you shouldn't be held hostage by the UI. You should be able to say, okay, this is what I want to see as a screen. Now, how am I going to get it? Am I going to embed some Power BI or Time Series Insights and thing? Am I going to build on a natural maps or am I going to use one of the vendors um, things? But you should be able to tell, for example, let's say you use Iconics. You should be able to tell Iconics, I want you to stick a Power BI chart in here. Or you should be able to talk, tell Willow, I want to see a Time Series Insights window here and so on, right? Um, and don't forget, of course, that you've got to deal with both the web interface, the mobile interface, and any wearables interface. Uh, moving on quickly, oh, demo. Uh, was I going to show you a demo? OK, let me just show you one screen. Um, here is uh, Time Series Insights, where we can say, OK, let's overlay temperature on there, or let's overlay uh, occupancy on there, or let's show if there's any security alerts, and so on. Again, that is just a. Uh, an interface on which we're able to decide what telemetry goes in there, what insights go in there. Most people these days are writing their, their interfaces in um, something called React, and you can start embedding all those widgets from all of those into it. Uh, last but not least is this question of how do you solve problems, uh, deal with remediation. Uh, and you know, the goal here is to fix problems, you know, fix the right problem with the right person at the right time fix them before they become big problems, uh, schedule your workforce better, uh, reduce the amount of manual labor, uh, fix problems with the first visit, and so on. And um, you know, uh, what we've done is we've applied a whole bunch of our own technologies to take, as it were, any third party application that's interoperable and so on, and be able to pump the, the data into Dynamics Field Service, uh, which is our tool for scheduling people uh, assigning people, creating uh, work orders, uh, working out who's available to work on a problem, who's got the skills to work on a problem, and so on. Uh, so this is where, uh, again, the people that are actually uh, using the system, in this case, uh, on our campus will be CBRE, or maybe it's JLL, or, or um, your own workforce that are, that are actually working the problems. We don't want uh, the data to come uh, onto one screen here and then they have to go and use a chalkboard to write it down, and then they go and type it into here, right? What we've done is we've automatically integrated. So if a, if a, if a system here provides an insight, there are too many people in the room, or the air conditioning is broken, it appears in Dynamics Field Service as a, uh, a problem that needs to be addressed and allows you to prioritize them, pick some dispatch people, and so on. Uh, do I uh, just demo? Well, let me just show you what I was going to demo to you, uh, and that is, you know, here is here is Dynamics Field Service. Uh, you know, there there are worker orders in it. Uh, eventually, will come up. I have time for it to show work orders. Mm, yeah. So there are work orders, and notice this work order uh, is on my lab right here. Please fix the the uh, the the network in my lab. Um, I wanted to end with showing you a quick video. What we've talked about so far is areas where, um, you know, we can have an impact and in some sense, the past and the current. But let me just end this thing with a three minute video on the future. And Stan, I'm relying on you to tell me whether the volume comes through. Innovation is a journey without an end. Work that's never done. We're constantly pushing the possibilities of our physical and digital worlds worlds that are increasingly converging. Driven forward by technology, from cloud to the edge, AI and IoT. Now allowing us to create digital models of our physical spaces, called digital twins. Creating the stories, touch points, and solutions by realizing the relationships and interactions between people, places, and devices. And with the promise of AI, we can uncover insights that see problems before we experience them. We can better understand needs and improve experiences. We can see, learn, and even predict how people move through and interact with the spaces around them. Connecting these stories and data to power modern business, building new possibilities in real time.
Made possible by our partners and an end-to-end three cloud capability. Azure, Office, Dynamics. Help bring to life smarter spaces that connect to a digital world and turn new possibilities into new realities. So that was clearly a, you know, uh, unabashed marketing video. Uh, but the, the point is that, you know, way beyond what we're doing now with just fixing an air conditioning and so on, uh, where we're seeing all this technology take us is into completely new realms, the realms where we've got, we've got uh, uh, way better ways of making people uh, interact with their environment, right? And not limited to what a few engineers can do here or a few dispatchers can do there and so on. And what we've got is uh, in an inordinate amount of people working in our engineering teams, working with our partners, uh, like the ones that are uh, sponsoring this conference, to deliver new capabilities uh, and to come up with things that you know make your spaces um, uh, adapt to you, make your spaces safer, healthier, and so on, all the same uh, at the same time as making them. Uh, more uh, economical to run for the building owners. With that said, we've probably got, uh, as I can see, eight minutes left. So, uh, and I see there are also Perfect. a couple of questions in there. Uh, in the, in the, um, in the, one of the questions that, that I see on there is what are we using for space occupancy information? And the answer to that one is um, we are testing out three or four things uh, on our own campus. We have customers that are using Verge Sense, uh, Point Grab, and various others. Um, we haven't made a uh, determination of what fits best in our architecture for our uh, current campuses. So but we're, in the, we're in the process of testing three or four of them. Are we doing anything with it? Uh, Esri? Yes, lots. Um, and we're also doing uh, lots with utility companies. Uh, one of the, not only are we looking at um, uh, how to curtail rates, take advantage of time of use and so on, but we're also dealing with, uh, let me stop sharing the screen. Uh, it's, maybe it's already stopped sharing. Um, we're, we have a number of things where we're working with companies and electrical grids around how can you tell uh, whether you're getting clean energy or, or not so clean energy at any point in time, and whether you ought to switch to, uh, if you use local storage, whether um, you should be taking from the grid at a point in time or uh, taking out of your local, uh, local uh, battery storage. We're working on um, ways to, uh, again, address the time of day thing. So um, get in energy uh, as much as you can when the, the rates are lowest, including um, going to local storage and then taking from local storage when the rates are higher and so on. This is particularly interesting also to, um, uh, for example, utility companies dealing with uh, the, the um, increase of electrical vehicles on the road. What they want to know is what's the battery charge state and direction of motion of all the vehicles that will ultimately park in their building. So they can try and devise incentives to make sure that not everyone uh, decide, demands charge immediately and then you know, causes a brownout in downtown Seattle. So yeah, we have a lot of people working on, on many of those different areas. Spiros, I'm wondering if you could, um, by the way, excellent presentation. Thank you. And, and great scramble back from, from the yeah. outage. You did a great job. I, I'm that. hoping that when you edit it and put it on, you get the we, cut we, out. We, we, will, we will make a proper amends. Um, I just wanted to uh, make sure that we fully exhausted this workforce question that came in. Clearly, what you've been describing here uh, is um, both traditional in relationship to we've always tried to manage our facilities and we've always tried to provide for uh, sort of user experience and user comfort, but uh, lots of different skill requirements now uh, associated with this. What's your view about the implications of this in relationship to workforce, both in terms of is there an expansive need in the smart buildings marketplace for more and more people uh, to do this? And what about their skill sets 
uh, in terms of do we need to be thinking about um, more in different kinds of training in order to take advantage of all of this? So yeah, so uh, great question. What we're seeing is that, uh, firstly, we, we, we still need all the skill sets that we had before. Mm -hmm. um, we are seeing that there are additional skill sets that are needed. Uh, and we're seeing that it's hard to recruit people um, because they're not seeing the, uh, the job track as particularly exciting compared to other things that are happening today. And so uh, one of the reasons that we're seeing a lot of interest in mobile devices and wearable devices is it makes the field of being, uh, you know, a, a field engineer uh, more sort of in the 21st century, right? And what we're seeing is that someone does need, you know, you, you need controls engineers, but those controls engineers need to have a lot more skills in computer technology than say they used to. Um, we're also seeing that there are needs for other types of things, like there's obviously more and more uh, computer programmers, uh, um, uh, AI, machine learning people that are needed to, to take advantage mm -hmm. of uh, or develop solutions which, um, uh, you know, address some of these newer things you can do or want to do. So there are additional skill sets needed. Well, there are additional types of people needed. There are additional skill sets for existing people, uh, but I don't see any uh, reduction in the need for uh, some types of people, you know, the, the, the guy who in the past, uh, was the right person to, um, optimize, a, an air handling unit is still the right guy. Now he may do that remotely. He may have more complex units to deal with, but he's still a, a, a type of person that's needed. Great. Um, that I, being said, we should pay them more. That, um, yes. Uh, a, a subject of an entire set of webinars uh, in and of itself. Yes. Um, I know we're approaching the top of the hour and I'm going to make the executive decision uh, with, with Spiros and Carrie's agreement that we extend out for about five minutes. So just to our participants, we will uh, get through a few more of the questions that you've put in and we'll go into overtime for about five minutes or so, but not abuse Spiros's time by asking him to do yeah. uh, any well, more than that. Uh, we've got an awful lot of energy uh, efficiency people uh, on this call and a number of them were really interested in um, the sort of case study that you showed at the very beginning looking at one of the Microsoft buildings and uh, the pretty dramatic drop in terms of electricity use um, that uh, not only occurred, and this is part of the question, but continued to happen over some period of time and is now persisting. Um, any more insight there in terms of, um, you know, what led to that reduction, just yeah, turning sure. stuff so, off when it shouldn't have been on, unoccupied spaces, yeah. uh, and so forth. So uh, firstly, to, to Greg Simpson's question about why was it such a steady pace for five years? And the answer is because that was the prettiest graph I could find. Uh, of our 125 <laughs> buildings, some, some sort of go up and down at different rates. Mm -hmm. uh, this was just the one that, that showed the most dr dramatic and simple thing. Otherwise, I'd have to explain that, you know, we did this thing in, in 2018, which cause uh, perturbation in the graph and so on. Uh, the big thing, of course, is that across the 125 buildings, it's a 30% reduction. Now, turning on and off equipment in unoccupied spaces is just a small part of it, because certainly pre-COVID, we did not have very many uh, unoccupied spaces. It's more about tuning uh, systems to work together. And, you know, Tuning is just a continual process. You tune it, you learn more, you tune it again, you learn more, you tune it again, you learn more. Plus, of course, um, just fixing problems as equipment deteriorates, the fan belt starts to wear out, uh, this bearing starts to wear out, there starts to be a leak here, and it's a continuous process. Uh, you know, as you do more and more of it, it gets, it gets better and better. 
but I would, I certainly would not want to imply that there was a linear reduction. And, and what we found is that between four and five years, it flattens out, right? You're, you're, you're flattened out at a certain amount uh, below your, your, your base rate. You don't keep going down until you're at, you know, until the electrical company is paying you to run the building. Um, there, was a, there was another question about what type of devices are gathering occupancy data. Uh, we've seen a lot of ones. We've seen both, um, and th there's different technologies that are involved in many of these. So for example, if all you care about is the room occupied or not, simple motion sensors work. If you want to know how many people are in the room, you need a different type of counting device. If you want to know the, the number of people uh, exactly, say to, you know, 95% accuracy, you need a different type of sensor than if you want to know only to 70% accuracy. Uh, if you decide you're going to do it with cell phones and so on, um, you've, got a, you've got a different inaccuracy based upon someone who carries two cell phones, someone that has no cell phone. If you want accuracy with respect to uh, time, you know, there's some, there's some of these systems that will give you up-to-date meaning correct to the five seconds. Others will only give you correct to the half hour. So it all depends on what, what your exact goals are uh, about which type of sensors you use. Now we've seen ones and we've done our own POCs with special badges, badges that have RFID, badges that are under desks. You sit at a desk and it suddenly says you're here uh, and so on. So the answer to Al French's question is all of the above and more. Um, and again, I, I haven't uh, seen anything where you would say uh, one size fits all or this is, this is the way to do it. Spiros, I, I'm uh, wondering um, if we could close out the session by having you no. address a question. No, can't do that. No, we, we must. Uh, that Carrie and I are, are, are really very interested in, and that's for you to look into the crystal ball a bit. Um, tell us a little bit about what your forecast is, say, pick a number, three years or five years in relationship to the smart buildings market. You really identified interoperability and system integration as being a challenge, which you're addressing head on. Uh, is that future one in which plug and play devices are commonplace? as machine learning and artificial intelligence now become a way for us to clarify this huge amount of data that we're getting into our buildings to make it easier for uh, the facilities folks in the buildings to know what to prioritize. What's your crystal ball for this? And we're, we're interested uh, both uh, for what you have to say and certainly what the Smart Building Center can do uh, in the future to help make this a reality. Yeah, I agree with everything you've said. Um, <laughs> so uh, certainly we're working hard to make that plug and play um, a reality, right? Uh, we have this concept of uh, plug and play devices for facilities, for, de for building devices. We have a common language called uh, DTDL, digital, digital twin definition language, uh, so that and we're working with device manufacturers and so on so that all the devices can express their data in the same way uh, they, that devices can essentially broadcast what they are and what their capabilities are to make it possible not to have to do all these gymnastics after the fact to say, you know, device 121033 happens to be a temperature sensor. Uh, we're working with with these uh, manufacturers also and everything from, you know, geosensing to uh, uh, ways that we can actually identify easily where something is. We're working with the, the, um, uh, the CAD and the BIM makers to try and get better uh, information uh, automatically in those ways to make sure that the BIM drawings of a building are um, updated in real time. Simply, you know, you place a new thermostat on the wall, you shouldn't have to then rely on someone going back, bringing up 
you know, rivet and, and typing in that they put this thing there. There should be some way that it gets detected and put in there. Um, someone moves a, an electrical panel three feet, that should automatically update and all the rules around it should update. So we're working on a lot of technologies to make this plug and play and discovery uh, much more efficient. Obviously our uh, digital twins technology is specifically designed to be able to, to house all this data and to make cross domain queries a uh, uh, much more efficient. So we are definitely working on technologies so that a lot of the uh, grunge work is removed um, and allows both uh, companies to focus on their secret sauce, focus on functionalities that are unique and differentiating for them, and also allow uh, building owners and, and occupiers and um, you know uh, uh, inventors and so on to be able to focus on doing new things without regard to how do I find this data? Where is it stored? How do I store it? How do I make sure that I've got the last six years worth of data and so on? Fantastic. Well, uh, this is a great spot uh, to, uh, on that note, to give our thanks certainly to you Spiros for uh, a, re a really great presentation. Thank you to our attendees. Uh, for uh, plugging in all this week. Uh, again, a reminder that this material will be made uh, available for you to access and we'll let you know the time and place uh, when that can happen. And uh, Carrie, uh, give us a, a final farewell and remind us again about the live in-person Smart Buildings Exchange in 2021. Sure. Well, happy Friday, everybody. Thanks for tuning in this week. Thank you to Stan for helping to organize all of these fantastic sessions and to Microsoft and all of our sponsors for a really, really compelling series of discussions. Um, as, a, as I was saying earlier during our momentary break, uh, we have postponed our in-person conference, which was originally scheduled for early September of this year, to August 24th and 25th in 2021. Uh, it will be in downtown Seattle at Bell Harbor, and our sponsors for this event remain our sponsors for next year. We hope to see you there. Stay tuned. Um, we'll be in touch with all those who registered for our series to share more details as they're confirmed. Have a lovely weekend, everyone. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Great. Britain. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, all.